We start off today's presentation in a different state. We're in Montana now. So if you can imagine how mountainous, how beautiful Montana is, I want to give you a little bit of a background on what it means to have mass wasting. So mass wasting is the process that we're going to talk about today. Uh, some of you have already been to Montana, I'm sure. Maybe you've been to places like Yellowstone National Park. Now, here's a, a map. This is called a digital elevation model of Montana, and Yellowstone National Park is shown down there. It just barely laps into parts of Montana, but there were some major earthquakes back in the 1950s, late 1950s, that altered the landscape here. And so what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of a background, a little bit of a, a tale, if you will, of what happened. It's a real life tale, sadly, um, for, uh, for Montana. So we're going to start with Yellowstone, actually, first, though. This is the track of the Yellowstone hotspot. Now, the hotspot itself is not moving across that area. The hotspot is pretty much stationary. But in fact, North America has gone over the top of that hotspot, and today uh, it's towards the northeast end of this area that is in the light yellow here, light gray, if you will. Uh, you can see where it cuts right across the mountain ranges and so forth as the hotspot has that sort of geothermal activity. And so you get things like uh, geysers, you get things like uh, hot springs. And in fact, there have been massive volcanic eruptions from the Yellowstone hotspot in the past and the ones that went across the entire continent. Uh, but in fact, uh, today we worry about it a little bit because I think if you recall, this is the one that has erupted about 2 million years ago, 2.1 million years ago. And then again, about uh, 1.2 million years ago. And then I think it was 600,000 years ago was the last major eruption in Yellowstone. So, but that's Yellowstone Lake here. You see the black area. Uh, in the uh, kind of the, the middle part of the eastern, uh, the, the, the uh, right-hand side of this, uh, of this map. So it's, it's a combination of a geologic map and a digital elevation model here. So here's some of the hot springs. You know, it's like if you have an area that's fairly wet and it's over the top of a magma chamber, you're going to have hot springs. And so this is just one of the hot springs here. And, of course, that's the major attraction for tourism to the uh, Yellowstone area. You know, Yellowstone was kind of passed by. It wasn't until the early 1970s, excuse me, 1870s that that uh, Americans actually visited this. Now, this was known to Native Americans forever, right? So they knew about the Yellowstone area, strong medicine here. But it was Nathaniel Pitt Langford and some other folks from Minneapolis who explored this area in 1870 or 1871. And uh, they described what was going on here. And so they were on pack horses. Well, they had horses and they also had pack horses and pack mules and so forth. And they would break through some of the crust here. You got to watch where you step in this material. This is called center, much of this. And so it's a silicate. It's sometimes a carbonate. And, uh, but it's a, it's a very, uh, fragile landscape. And so you got to watch. You can actually break through the crust of this material and wind up in a hot spring and scald yourself. It happens, it happens fairly regularly, I think, with a lot of folks who are, uh, tourists in this area. So they warn you, is like, stay on the trails. This is going to be something that is going to be dangerous. Okay. So you, you not only have dangers from the, the sulfurous fumes, which are abundant here, you also get it from the crust, the landscape itself, and it's easy to get scalded. So this is Mammoth Springs actually. And here you can see where some of this center has built out these sort of rimstone dams. And uh, so there are hot springs on the top surface of this. And so the water flows over the top then. You take water, you heat it up in that magma chamber, you have a plumbing system that brings it back up to the surface. Uh, and then sometimes that plumbing system gets kind of blocked up and the water pools in the subsurface and then it builds up and forms steam and you can form geysers. And so geysers are a result of the same sort of process, the mixture of a magma chamber plus, uh, you know, a very strong ejection from that steam eruption. Sometimes they blow up, actually. And so some geysers have been known to actually explode and then leave a crater behind. And that's with some of these hot springs are actually the crater from what would have been a uh, geyser at one time. Now, the official geyser, the actual Regu the, the feature that's known as geyser is actually in Iceland, but these were named for that feature in Iceland. And so these are in Yellowstone National Park. And rather than show you 
photograph of Old Faithful, why not show you this incredibly beautiful uh, Hudson, Hudson River School, they call these folks that were painters, back in the mid-1800s. This is Albert Bierstadt who painted these. Maybe you recall some of the, the beautiful paintings from uh, uh, Yosemite. He also did paintings here in Yellowstone as well. So, But that is uh, a geyser, okay? So a um, painting of a geyser, I should say. Um, from field trips, from trips that I've been up there, you see all sorts of beautiful things. Like here is a... An area they call these things extremophiles, and so in uh, the geysers of Yellowstone, you'll find all sorts of types of um, microbial lights, uh, things that have a photosynthesis, but at the same time, maybe they're sulfur fixing bacteria as well. And so, there's these things that live in extremely hot water, but not usually boiling water, and so. Uh, these are some some algae or some some uh, cyanobacteria that are able to withstand these high temperatures here. And here you can see the beautiful blue waters of the springs here. Now this is kind of an overcast day, so the water's not sterling, beautiful blue that you saw in an earlier image there. But but you get a sense that this is an area that is dominated by hydrothermal processes, in fact. And so, and it is. It's just the nature of the place. And so many of these, I wish I could convey this, but I just can't. The overwhelming odor of sulfur that goes along with many of these steam uh, sort of like eruptions here. You can actually see the water bubbling up here a little bit in the uh, background in this image. And so um, if you had smell-o-vision right now, you would be able to smell sulfur. And uh, it's really quite a, quite a fascinating place. And the whole reason for even talking about Yellowstone is because in this situation, we've already covered earthquakes, but now we're covering mass wasting, and they are not unrelated. In fact, as it turns out, earthquakes can actually generate mass wasting products that can cause things like landslides. And so we're going to look at a landslide case history here. This is the Hebgen Lake uh, area that you see here, and you can actually see the the outline of the lake here in the in the lower middle part of this image. It's just barely into Montana, just out of the the national park. And uh, so there's a town there called West Yellowstone. So West Yellowstone is that sort of place. Um, if you follow the news at all or Twitter feeds, things like that, there was a, a guy who was fishing on one of the rivers out there close to West Yellowstone, and he was mauled by a, a grizzly bear here just recently. Uh, in April and May, when the grizzly bears wake up, you don't want to be... <laughs> in a backwoods sort of area, okay, because they wake up hungry, <laughs> okay. So um, he was mauled by a bear, apparently. So um, this is the Hebgen Lake area here, and uh, in 1959, it was August 17th, and it was 11.50, 11.37 at night, I think, and um, the people that were camped in this area, and there's a whole bunch of different campgrounds in this area, uh, awoke when they heard this incredible roar of noise. And as uh, as the end result of the whole thing was that there were 28 people killed in this event. They didn't recover all their bodies. Some of the bodies are still, their remains were covered by this landslide. So we're going to go into this in a little bit of detail here. Here's uh, the road that's right next to Hebgen Lake here. And you're looking off into the distance here. There's actually a distant mountain range and then this nearby mountain range. In this nearby mountain range where it hits the main valley floor, just maybe 10 miles down the road here, it's a place called Missouri Flats. And so Missouri Flats was actually established, well, settled by by white Americans in... 1911, okay, so Native Americans knew about this place forever, okay, so this was their land, really, you know, but by 1911, it had become part of Montana, and so uh, they had, uh, you know, people from Missouri had settled in that area, and they called it Missouri Flats. Hebgen Lake itself was built in 1914, <laughs> which is Seems like a long time ago. It's over a hundred year old, a uh, hundred years old at dam, but uh, 
it became famous after this and they established the park. So if they, they explored the park in the 1870s, by ni early 1900s, people were all already beginning to move into this area. And so there was a, a establishment of resorts and things like that. Certainly by the 1950s, these things were pretty popular. So people have been fishing here forever. Um, and so in 1959, that earthquake occurred and it caused a series of ground ruptures. And in this case, you can actually see after that earthquake shook this landscape, uh, there were people who were camped nearby and uh, they decided to like, hey, we're going to get the heck out of here. And they drove and they didn't expect the road to disappear in front of them. And so this was a family of four and uh, I think it was four or five. And um, and the car actually went over this embankment that had been created by the, f the rupture of this earthquake. So there were ground ruptures in many places associated with this earthquake. It was a magnitude uh, 7.2. Now, that doesn't sound as high as a magnitude 9. Well, you know how much energy there is released by earthquakes now, but um, 7.2 earthquake was the fourth largest earthquake at that time in 1959 in all of the United States. Okay, so, and these people kind of, you know, it's like, we got to get the heck out of here. You know, we're going to go to someplace that may be safe. Okay, so the ground was shaking and so forth. They got in their car and they drove off and it flipped the car over actually, but nobody was killed. Fortunately, nobody was killed in that accident. Um, but you know, it makes a good photo op. I guess you could say here's that same road, the early color photograph from the 1950s here. And, uh, you can see the lake waters, uh, impinging on that. And part of the, the road was actually swept into the lake. As it turns out, <laughs> this is a sage. <laughs> You know, we talked about seiches. That's where you have a sloshing of water. It's not a tsunami, but the water came on shore and washed part of this landscape away. Um, is, I recall, I think it was like a 19-foot jump that the water took. Now, the, the south side of the lake rose like almost 20 feet. And, and the north side, which is which side this road is on, dropped like 20 feet. And so, but it also broke up the road here, you can see. And so that's actually part of a fault scarp here that uh, laps onto where the road is here. And part of it just collapsed then. And in a way, you can call that a mass wasting event as well. It also took out some buildings as well. There was um, a woman who owned the uh, resort there. I think her name was Miller. And she, uh, she was felt the shaking and everything. And all of a sudden <laughs> the wave sloshed on shore. She was on the North side. Her resort was there and her, she and her dog leapt from their house onto what was an, a, a little bit higher ground. And she and the dog were able to survive because of that, because it dropped like 15, 20 feet, right where her resort was. And so the water came in. I'll show you some pictures of where her resort was, but it caused these giant waves. The seiche came on shore and washed some of the cabins away. And so uh, this is where she had jumped to shore here. And this is actually her house. This is the house that she had. And she had a whole series of cabins along, stretched along the river here, a lot stretched along the lake. You can see that the road drops off precipitously there. And this is actually after this occurred. And so that house is actually kind of washed <laughs> close to back onto shore here. Uh, it had come loose from its foundation, obviously, here. And here it is um, preserved in the lake. And it's still preserved in the lake today. So this is one of the cabins actually right here. This cabin, in fact, is, is you know, a log cabin. That's what you build things out of in western Wyoming in uh, eastern, southeastern, southwestern Montana here. And that's the original structure itself. It still stands today. In fact, this was a photograph that was taken in 2011 right here. So 10 years ago, it was still there. Um, here is the roof of her house. Now it's, it's washed on shore. You can see the pilings in the background there that that's where she had a dock and everything. And so this thing was washed out and uh, washed along the shoreline. There's a whole series of other cabins that were in this area. And those cabins actually floated in the water and eventually came to rest when they lost their 
their air pocket, if you will. And they, and they call it a ghost city, I think, or ghost town, if you will, just because these cabins didn't have anybody in them after they finally came to rest. And they came to rest in a haphazard sort of fashion all over the landscape here. So that's one of the cabins right there that's that's undergone some destruction. Now, I've been here so many times. Okay, so um, when I was here, I, this is a photograph right here from 1986, okay, <laughs> with some, some friends of mine, actually. So that's Kevin Sajas in the, in the foreground here, and next to him was my... Uh, my uh, roommate actually at field camp. And so this is all from a geology field camp and we had visited this area. So that's Hebgen Lake out here. You can see there's a dead tree in many of the houses. And so that's the roof of the same house that, uh, well, it's in this image right here from, uh, from 2011. So it's still in the water today. They preserve this area. And in fact, they have what they call, uh, the, it's a, it's an earthquake area. They have, uh, trails through here to show you the various features because this was a major event 19, 1959 and, and you'll see why here in a minute um, here's some more of the foundation of course from that uh, from that uh, cabin here you can see the landscape uh, as it is today well 2011 anyway and you can see the fault scarp as it curves around here on the north uh, rim of the the lake here and in the distance those are those are places that uh, have survived. Actually, that's construction going on, working on the dam. So that's actually the dam at Hepkin Lake. In 1914, it was built. In 1959, it survived that earthquake. Everybody was really concerned that this dam was going to be uh, broken in some way, and it's going to release a huge flood of water. Uh, the alarm went out downstream. There's a little town called Ennis downstream from here, and Ennis was evacuated that night uh, because of fears for Hebgen Lake actually draining into the Madison River. So this is the Madison River Valley here, and uh, and here you can see as we get farther and closer you know, farther away from the resort now and farther downstream where the canyon kind of narrows down a little bit, you can actually see here, not only Hebgen Lake, uh, well, actually, you're seeing here is a second lake that was formed after Hebgen Lake, and it was formed because of this natural dam that was built at that on that very evening. There was a huge landslide, and so this landslide right here piled up sediment that blocked off the, the Madison River, and so... Uh, even in the river itself, there were huge 30-foot waves that ran upstream and downstream when this earthquake occurred, and this landslide got triggered by that earthquake. And so this was a massive event. A massive amount of rock came off of the side of the mountain there, slid down, blocked off the river. And of course, if you block off a river, river and you, you have a temporary dam built there, it may only last for a week or two. And so they got in here fairly quickly. So this was in August. By October, I think it was, they had finally stabilized what is today sort of a makeshift, it's still today, a makeshift sort of spillway where it allows the river to kind of flow through on one side uh, from this lake. But this is called Earthquake Lake today. It was a lake that was generated by that earthquake. And this is a natural process that occurs in many places around the world, as it turns out. And I think I may have mentioned previously that oftentimes disasters, especially earthquakes, they can lead to other disasters. And so in this case, this earthquake could potentially, it not only spawned this, this massive uh, rock slide here, or this ma massive landslide, it blocked the river off, and the next thing in the progression would be then to have a breakout flood that would then obliterate some of the, the, the ranches and the, the cities, the towns that are downstream from here. That still happens today. Okay, It's happened in the Caucasus Mountains, for example, in, in Ossetia and other places like that in, uh, in the, uh, in, well, between Europe and Asia in that sort of uh, vicinity. So uh, this in the Madison River Canyon here, that's Earthquake Lake. 
Uh, just to show you some features, this was a USGS report from back in the 19, early 1960s. They went out to investigate this, or late 1959. They went out to investigate this, and actually you can see here the fault scarp. We talked about what fault scarps are, and here you can actually see, let me do it the right way, here you can see the the foot wall has moved down relative to the hanging wall here. And so the, well, actually the foot wall has moved up relative to the hanging wall. So the hanging wall is the side that the, the lower trees are on here. And the foot wall is the other one. You can actually walk up that slope if you dug your feet in pretty good. Um, that's a normal fault right there. So there's normal fault over here below the geologist that has the little jeepster over here on the uh, left-hand side of this image. And so that is the sort of thing that geologists want to get out and do. They want to study these earthquakes as rapidly as they can after the earthquake has occurred and so you can map and and measure the offset along these faults like this and you can then see the magnitude of that earthquake and then you push the uh, piece the puzzle together and then we can better understand the processes by which earthquakes occur so here you have fault scarp on the left hand side fault scarp on the right hand side in fact, there were probably five or six different fault scarps that were active and show fault movement on blocks of rock that dropped down in this situation. So these were all normal faults for the most part here. Here's another one. You can see the geologist actually standing in a trench that's a natural trench where on the left-hand side to his right-hand side, he would be looking at the 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 hanging wall, the foot wall is on the right hand side, on the right hand side of this image, his left hand side. And so it shows you the alluvium that it accumulated there and then the fault occurred and then once I drop, once I drop down. And um, that is one of the fault scarps, of course, with this earthquake, Lake Hebgen earthquake 1959. So if you're a tree and you're living near one of these fault scarps, and if you're relatively young, uh, you would actually be tilted, perhaps. And so as you get tilted, as time goes along, it kind of has a tendency to straighten back up. And so that's one of the tilted or drunken trees that you can see here on the right-hand side of this image. And so that is another uh, aftermath of this, of this sort of... Uh, event right here. So here's part of the trail. Nancy's walking ahead here on the trail. You can actually see the fault scar heading straight across on the right hand side of that trail. And so that is the fault scar that's covered by vegetation there. On the left hand, uh, on the right hand side, on, the, on this other image over here, you can actually see trees that were uh, writing that the, the block that was heading down there. And in fact, I've got an image to show you. Those are the well, in fact, if you back up two images here, you'll see the same trees. That fault scarp that two images ago here uh, was exposed. That is that same fault scarp today. And so you can see down on the right-hand side, up on the left-hand side here. So what did it look like back then? So it's got you know, lots of campgrounds back then. So Hebgen Lake was already there. So you have the Cabin Creek um, area, the, the campfire uh, ledge there. So you've got... I think one of the more uh, precarious sort of places was this Rock Creek campground down here. And uh, even though there were 28 people killed in this event, um, there were over 200 survivors from these campgrounds. People were here, okay? So it was like, uh, the estimate is there were like 18,000, you know, they keep track of how many people visit the National Park every day. And so on August the 17th, 1959, there were 18,000 people in Yellowstone National Park. If you did that today, you'd probably have 150,000 or more uh, people on any given day in the park, probably closer to 200,000, 250,000. Um, but back then, so people didn't stay in the park always. They would maybe come out and camp outside of the park in places like this. So the actual slide itself that occurred is down here on the lower left-hand side, and you can kind of see where it says slide area down here. It's a little bit fuzzy there, but that's an old map from that vintage, and so it shows you where that slide was. This is a historic image that shows you what it looked like before that earthquake 
and the landslide occurred. So that's the hillside that gave way over there. And here's a guy trout fishing in, in Madison, in the Madison River here. Here's what it looked like afterwards. And so this is the Hebgen Lake landslide that generated Earthquake Lake, which is down below here. And that, um, the campground was over here on the right hand side. And, uh, there was enough material that came down the hill. And, and when it came down the hill, it actually went up the other side of the valley and then came rushing back down the valley again. So it, it cut loose on the left hand side, crossed over to the right hand side on this image, and then partially slid back again on here. Most of the campgrounds were full. And so people were camping along the river. Uh, as the best estimate they have is there are 28 people that were killed in this uh, event. Uh, m most of the bodies were not recovered. Nine were. There was uh, one woman who was washed by the, first of all, after that tremendous noise from the earthquake itself and then from the landslide being generated, the landslide displaced the air in the valley. And so there were winds up to 200 miles an hour that toppled the trees. And it, the, the, the earthquake, the landslide itself generated waves upstream and downstream. And so people hung on as best they could. It blew their clothes off. It blew their, blew their shoes off and things like that. But here they are trying to survive this event. There's a woman who, uh, had, had, grabbed onto, I think she was trapped underneath of a tree and she actually clawed her way out from underneath of that tree. She later succumbed to her injuries in the hospital, uh, later, but, uh, but there are other people who survived this event and, uh, families that were broken apart by this event as well. So some survivor, some survived and some didn't people clutched onto trees and did the best they can. There's a couple, an older couple who were camped right along the river here. And, uh, when the wave came along, it, it took their, their trailer and they got out of the trailer. They had to get and stand on the trailer. And eventually they could no longer stand because the water began to rise almost immediately after this, as it began to fill up earthquake lake, because the Madison river is a big river and there's a lot of volume of water that flows through that river. And so you very quickly form a pretty good lake here. They, they grabbed onto a tree and they were hanging onto the tree and they were in their 70s, these, this couple. And so as they're hanging on this tree, uh, they, uh, they, <laughs> the water kept getting deeper and deeper. And so they hung on from that 1137 event, you know, and then the rockfall and then the water. And then so like one thing after another. And the wife says, let me go. Just let me go, honey. You know, it's like she didn't want to cause him to lose his life where he might potentially be able to like swim to shore or whatever. But he wouldn't let go. And he he held on to her until six o'clock when they were rescued the next morning. And so people knew about this almost immediately because if nothing else, it did not cut the telephone lines. And so they were able to make telephone calls out and reach the authorities. And the authorities immediately began to assemble teams that would make it into this area uh, to try to help rescue people. And so that is where the slide was. Here's the a Google Earth image for where the slide area is today. And you can actually see Quake Lake over here on the upper right. And um, the slide area, it cut loose from the south side and rushed across that landscape up to the north side here, burying some of the uh, the folks, of course, in the that were caught in the landslide. And the... Well, today it's kind of a sacred spot because you're really looking at what is a graveyard for a few people who lost their lives in this event. And so here is that landslide scarp. Um, as it turns out, most of the rocks here are metamorphic in the basement and there were sedimentary rocks over the top and everything was kind of dipping to the, to the north here. And so when it just loosened up those rocks and everything came cascading down along these slide planes, essentially, and so that is an example of a landslide. And we're going to look at landslides in great detail, but that is where it is today. And so if you go on to the next slide, it shows you panning, panning to the right, what it looks like a little bit farther along here. And today there's even trees. So if you didn't know it, 
trees are beginning to grow back, you know, in some of this landscape. And so the, um, it's, it's covered by debris, right? Rocks, boulders, you know, things like that. One of the largest boulders that actually cut loose, it's a piece of dolomite that came from the south side of that canyon. It wound up on the north side of the canyon and isolated here. It's actually a site where they have, um, my, well, that's where the, the they erected the monument essentially on that one large boulder so it's the big block here that became then the memorial for the people who lost their lives and so here's the list of 29 people who lost their lives and um so these things occur in nature uh, here's a here's a, an account from one of the people who survived this event i i heard a terrible rumble and looked up and i saw the whole mountain crumbling it was awful i saw a lot of fighting in World War II. This is somebody who was a veteran, obviously, and I never heard such a roar. Okay, so if you've ever heard artillery and things like that, this the roar sounded like the end of the world. If you've never been an event, yeah, and you know, I've been through tornadoes before, but never ones that took a house or anything very tragic. I was almost hit by a, a falling rock myself one time. I mean, it was a big one too, and it hit the lake. It was right next to me here, and uh, but you know, I dodged it and dodged all the smaller boulders that were coming down afterwards. And it's like yeah, you feel pretty good for having survived something like that. But if you know that it took somebody else's life, you have a different perspective on things like that. Um, and if you're from this area at all, uh, maybe you're familiar with the tornado that hit Joplin a few years ago. I was there two days afterwards bringing some food to people who were in need, diapers, anything that potentially that folks could potentially need. And so I was there with a, an organization that was helping with the survivors who survived that tornado. I think it was in 2011. Um, but that uh, tornado, I've never seen anything like that. And I can tell you that's yeah, changed my life a little bit because when you see the sort of, you give it a deeper respect for the processes that occur in nature. I saw leaves that were driven into a tree that had been completely stripped of its bark. And so every bit of everything was taken off three feet above the ground pretty much there. So these are the sort of events that change people. So uh, here are the survivors. They were in a, a camped in a field here. Uh, this is a this is a place that didn't get flattened. But but remember that landslide blocked the road in one direction. In the opposite direction, it was blocked because you couldn't drive along it because that's where that car had flipped over. So that was farther to the east, and so they were trapped in here. There's no way to get out. Yeah, so you could, you know, if you had the proper, you know, vehicle, you might be able to get out. But most of these folks were in station wagons and were very popular sedans. And so this is a place, they call it Refuge Point. And so this is a place where people camped after the event in order to make it. There were 250 people here that survived this. Okay. And so they had to be evacuated. Um, so it was a major event in 1959, one of the four largest earthquakes in the U.S. up to that point. And uh, people survived it. So this is a process. That landslide is a process we call mass wasting in geology. So mass, in other in other words, is like you know that characteristic of matter is that it weighs something, right? And so things that are heavy and are at high elevation have a tendency to try to get to low elevation at some point. They have what we call potential energy. And so as you shake something and you allow that to then escape from the, the claws of gravity, I guess gravity is pulling it downward. And so um, in newspapers, they call them landslides. In geology, we call it mass wasting. So that's the only difference between them. It's like, what realm are you talking in? And so we're going to talk a little bit about these. And so the, it all has to deal with either the motion that that material is undergoing or the type of material that it is, or the velocity which, which, with which it moves. And so we're going to talk about three different motions. That is, things can slide, they can slip, if you will, or they can flow. If you break something loose, here's, here's a thought for you. Uh, if you can imagine having your bedroom closet, 
And then somebody was pulling a practical joke on you, right? And so they just thought, you know, let's get up in the ceiling and let's load this closet full of marbles. And they, they dump, you know, say they had unlimited budget, right? All these marbles into your closet. And you come along and you were actually able to open the door, which is in question, I would say. But if you did open that door, all of those marbles would make a, hero a horrendous noise, right? As they're flowing, they would flow out of your closet. So they're not moving in one individual mass. They're not sliding out of your closet. They are flowing out of your closet. So in other words, you can have rock material that can flow, or you can have marble material that can flow. You can have any solid, and even snow and ice can flow. And we call those avalanches, right? So an avalanche is actually a snow and ice flow along with some stuff that it picks up along the way, of course, rocks and trees and little animals and maybe even people for, for that matter. But that's what an avalanche is. It's a flow of a mass of material. So you can have slides where you have a cohesive block that slides down a surface. Or you can have a flow where everything becomes non-cohesive or it, it breaks apart. In other words, that's what non-cohesive means. It's not sticking together. And then lastly, you could have something that just simply falls. And so those are the three types of motion. It's easy to figure out what the materials are. We're talking about rock. We're talking about a mixture of materials. Or we're talking about mud. And so you can have any three of those. And they're different. Some people call them earth. You know, so like they would call it rock and then mixed material and earth. That mixed material, by the way, we're going to call that debris. So we're going to have rock, debris, and earth or mud in this case. And so how do they flow? You know, so we can characterize these things. Do they flow very, very rapidly? And they can. They can flow like water. You know, those marbles would flow very, very fast out of your closet. Mud can flow fast, too, if it is channelized and it makes its way out. And in fact, you already know about volcanic mud flows. We call those lahars. It's really like muddy water, but it has the consistency of concrete. And so many of these sort of mud flows or debris flows would have that same consistency. They just wouldn't be hot material. So they can go relatively slow or they can go very, very fast. And so that's... Um, those are the processes that we're talking about here, the motion, the velocity, and then the material that's there. So that's the categorization. This is probably the most important slide. This is slide number 37 in this presentation. Most of these have just been like, hey, look at this, look at that, you know, but this one's pretty important. And the next slide is here to help you see what these things look like when, you know, an artist gets into it and say, how do I show that there is a rotational aspect to a landslide? And so among these different types of, of slides, some of them have a rotational aspect and those we're going to call slumps. And so that's what that is in the upper left-hand side of this image right here. You can actually see a slump. And it's like a Listrick fault. You know, if you recall, Listrick faults have that sort of like, you know, concavity. And so when something rotates like that, it has a Listrick fault scarp back here. And so that is a rotational landslide, or it's a slump, we call it, in geology. So on the second image over, that's the one that I just described. That's a slump in A there, or a rotational landslide. You can call it either one, but I, I would prefer that you call it a slump because that's usually what I teach is these things are really slumps. There are very few of these things that are actually in the public domain where you can say, I can use this, you know, in order to show you what's here. A translational, a translational landslide is where something slips down a slide plane like here, and you can actually see that slip surface at the base of that material. So it's just sliding as though it were a carpet on an incline. And then the next one is a block slide. And so there's a block of cohesive material that's sliding downhill here. And uh, a rock fall is pretty straightforward. It's rock material. What's the motion that it's doing? It's falling. And so that happens very commonly when rocks dip towards a, like a, a thoroughfare or road. Uh, in road cuts, they very commonly put in terraces in order to stop these things from making it out into the roadway. You don't want in the middle of night to be able to run into a boulder in the middle of a highway, right? And so you want it, that boulder to stop. And so 
there's a certain formula. There's, a, there's actually a computer program that was written in order to stop that from happening. It's called Rockfall, I think. There's a topple block in the middle image here. There's a debris flow on the right-hand side. So if you can imagine a slump, slumps can start as a rotational block movement like this. But then once they get past the lip of that slump scarp, they can then break apart. And so as they break apart, they're coming downhill in a non-cohesive fashion. And so that's when you get the debris flows. And of course, debris is a mixture of rock and earth and trees and other materials that may be in there, right? So you can see a debris avalanche over here on the left-hand side where something has detached from the surface and just avalanche is avalanche is a term we use for flow. And so here's an earth flow then in the middle part here. Notice it started with a slump scarp and there's a, a scarp actually exposed on that one. Uh, but that's an earth flow in the middle and the bottom down here. And then lastly, there's a process in mass wasting we call creep. That's where you have Water saturated muds, water saturation is a very key component for landslides as it turns out. And if it's water saturated, it weighs more and the work of gravity will slowly pull things down slope. And so that's what creep is down here on the right hand side, lower right hand side. And in fact, that's what you see in this image. This is from Montana as well. This is a little bit south of, uh, it's not Livingston. Let's see, what's the other What's the other uh, city? Uh, Dillon. It's a little bit uh, south of Dillon. And there's actually a fault scarp that runs along the edge of this mountain range. And you can actually see where that earth material has begun to creep down slope here. So it's very, we call it hummocky. So it's got bumps in it, essentially. And so that is an example of creep on that surface there. Okay. So when we talk about avalanches, we're talking about snow and ice that are really flowing. And so it's unstable material under the force of gravity. It's going to try to attain greater gravitational stability by going from a high elevation to a low elevation. And of course, when that happens, it releases energy. So when you release that energy, it has the capacity to not only keep these particles in motion, it also generates noise and it takes things and plucks things off of the valley walls and eventually redeposits everything in a, in a more gravitationally stable sort of uh, aspect at the, at the foot of this canyon than in this case. So, um, it, okay, so if you have a mountainous area and you have lots of snowfall, you see things like this, this, this buddy of mine actually from 1986, <laughs> sliding down this avalanche. So an avalanche had come through here during the, the season and you can see all the the trees and things like that that were plucked up, you know, and branches and all in this. And, of course, we were there afterwards and hiking up in this canyon. This is like little Snowbird Canyon, I think, in, in, uh, in Utah. And so we're having fun. You're sliding down the hillside on an avalanche scarp. And so you see these sort of things. And you see these sort of things in mountainous uh, vicinities all the time. I'm going to show you one now. It's another example of a mass wasting event where it is related to a glacier, a glacier that actually had an avalanche and it plucked loose from the landscape. And it has a tendency to do this every 80 or 90 or 100 years. This is in the Caucasus Mountains. The Caucasus Mountains are relatively high mountains, 10,000, 11,000, 12,000, 15,000 feet in some of uh, this area that joins Europe together with Asia. And so this is um, a little bit south of Russia here. And so if you look at this image right here, you can actually see on the left-hand side where there is a lake. That lake has that sort of beautiful emerald uh, green, you know, it's turquoise blue water, uh, if you will, there. The landslide has actually blocked off a side canyon there. And so when you look at this, that is a valley. And so it was a valley that was, this photograph was taken from a satellite imagery course, and it was taken in the morning. And so the areas in shade on here are the east sides of the valley. And the west side of the valley is in full sunlight from the sun rising from east, setting in the west. And so you can see where this thing actually detached down in the lower part of this of this photo and it came all the way down to the end of the valley out there when that occurred 
there were villages that were in this valley and it took them out. And so that debris flow that came through here, it, it incorporated everything it could pick up along the way and deposit it down at the end down there. And of course, these things have a tendency to dam up any streams that may be tributaries to that main valley. And that's what happened here. Um, that's happened more than you might think in the geologic past. There's actually a landslide in, in Wyoming known as the Grovant landslide that blocked up a valley and then the valley filled with water. And then there was this outbreak flood that came in and wiped out a small town and it killed, killed several people actually in that town, you know, the, the massive flood that came along afterwards. So this is another one of these double sort of tragedies in the making here. Anyway, I think they were probably able to uh, to breach that dam and to make it safe again. In this next image, this is actually you know, when I was with the USGS, I did some cruises along the the coast of Northern California here, and so we had uh, we would go out and collect sediment samples from the ocean floor. But when we were doing that, we took photographs from along the uh, the shoreline here and here you can actually see what L Creek and you see that massive rock face there what you don't see in this image very well until you look at the inset at the very bottom down here in that inset you can actually see there's a road that runs along there that's highway one I'm gonna show you another photograph from highway one in 1989, you guys already know the story about the World, Seri uh, World Series earthquake. The Loma Prieta earthquake occurred in October of that year. Most of the people who were injured were killed in the Nimitz Freeway catastrophe or on the Bay Bridge and a few other places. Maybe the Marina had a, a few uh, casualties as well. There were a few casualties down in Santa Cruz as well. There were, you know, I think, nine people killed at this site right here. And this is where there was a van parked along the side of the highway here. And when that earthquake occurred, it triggered a landslide. Now, there's actually a very famous, I can't show you this, but there's a very famous postcard that shows that landslide and occurrence. There was a, a photographer who had placed his camera looking at the sunset at this time on that beautiful rock face right there. And so when the earthquake occurred, it shook loose a lot of the rocks from this. And it took a van that had parked along, looking out at the ocean and knocked it off into, well, into the, off the edge of the highway there and killed several people, a family. And so there were other places that were affected by this earthquake as well. This is one of the more famous ones right here. I think it wasn't during the 1989 earthquake, but it was later. I think it was in 1995. We had a, this is when I was living in California. We had a, a year that was an El Nino year, very wet. It had rained every day for, I think, 50 days practically. So all the way from January into April, uh, into March anyway, it had uh, it had rained, and so there were landslides everywhere. So this is one of the places that had a massive landslide. This is called Devil's Slide here. And it's a place where that same highway, Highway 1, snaked its way along this coastline. And they have to cross these sort of surfaces where there have been landslides in the past. Now, in the past, when these things have landslides, the material would come down, land on the road, as it turns out. There's a lot of people who use this road in order to commute to work. And so they weren't able to do that after this last landslide in 1995, I think it was. That was a massive landslide. And they decided after that to then build a tunnel underneath of the mountain right next to this. Now, that's how desperate people are, okay, in order to like to not have to have to drive, uh, you know, an extra 100 miles to go to work. Um you can see here anyway that that's the landslide area. So on the lower left-hand side, that's the area off to the left. And here you are looking back towards that little lone rock. Um, and that lone rock is up here on the top panorama over here on the left-hand side. So that lone rock has like a, a lighthouse at the top. Oh, actually, it's a, it's a pillbox from World War II when we were trying to protect the coastline there. This is a, um, a place where when those landslides occur in the past, all they had to do was come along with a bulldozer and knock the material off, shift it off, and it would land on the bottom down there right at the ocean, right? They stopped doing that, 
because there are California sea lions who who live down there. That's their habitat. And so, you know, with the regulations and everything, it's like, okay, you can't push the stuff off the side anymore. So they had to come along, scoop it up with front loaders and then take it somewhere else to dump it. And so that is the story of, well, it's called Devil Slide. Devil Slide along Highway 1 in in California. I think it's San Mateo uh, County here. Um, these things happen a lot of different places. So here's another one that has a, a nice scarp up here at the upper right, or excuse me, on the left over here. That's just a rock fall on the right where a face is detached and fallen down. That's from West Texas on the right-hand side here. We saw that on a field trip that we went on. On the left-hand side, I'm not exactly sure where that is, but it illustrates how you can have debris sliding across the landscape. So what it shows two processes really is like the beginning was a slump or a, you know, a break essentially there at the top up here. And you can actually see the material deposited down slope then mass wasting events. I'm going to take you to Scotland next. So this is Scotland right here. In fact, this is one of the more beautiful places in Scotland. It's in the west of Scotland, it's an it's an island called the Isle of Skye, and the Isle of Skye has the Coorongs, and then you also have the uh, Quillens. The Quillens are volcanic mass in the in the kind of the eastern part of the island, and but this is the Coorongs here, and so you can actually see where blocks have detached and slid slightly downhill, and so it leaves these sort of pinnacles behind, and so that's. Uh, think taken from the old man of store over here on the left hand side and there's a, a needle I think they call this one on the right hand side down here at the bottom blocks that have rotational aspect and things slide under uh, from below to uh, to take those and redeposit them off the edge of that cliff and so that's what you see here so that's on the Isle of Skye in, in Scotland um, because I, this is not my specialty, I don't have a lot of images of these things. So this is from Wikipedia right here. This is a, this shows you another place where there are these arcuate sort of shapes that are scarps up in the upper parts of these mass wasting events. There was a landslide that broke apart the rock, right? So that's mostly rock, rock slide here. So this rock slid downhill. You can see the trees are still intact on some of these blocks, but here... It's taking out part of a village. I think that's from Brazil or it's from South America. I'm pretty sure anyway. So, but that is an image of what it looks like to have yet another type, another variety of rock material detaching from a hillside and then being redeposited and coming into a valley. And so, you know, people live everywhere, right? So people live in valleys where you're susceptible to floods. People live on hillsides where you're susceptible to mass wasting events. This is an image here of what we call a rock avalanche. So if you have rock material that flows like the marbles, you would call that a marble avalanche, if you will. In this case, we're going to call this a rock avalanche. So rock that flows is called an avalanche. It's not called a rock flow, in other words. We have debris flows, we have mud flows, but then we have rock avalanches. Those three all together right there are the motion of flowing. And that's what happened here in 1964. You, you recall the Good Friday earthquake in Alaska in 1964. It was a magnitude 9 earthquake, and it deposited a whole bunch of rock. In this case, down valley, it broke loose, and it went over this. It went over a glacier. So it's very easy to see here, and you can actually see the flow lines in that rock avalanche as the rock material spread out across that glacier, over the Sherman Glacier here in 1964. As we go farther, here's an easy one to see where there's a cohesive block. The grass didn't get broken apart or anything like that, but you can see a whole series of fractures on a cohesive block that has detached and it's actually rotated slightly and been redeposited downhill. Well, this is going to cause some real, some real heartache for the people that live in this area. That's a pasture right here, obviously, you know, and so all of a sudden you've got animals and all sorts of you know, buildings and everything, all the infrastructure is gone there pretty much. And so that is a slump. Then it then had a, left that cohesive mass, 
mass there, and there would be a an earth flow at the very bottom of this. You don't see that. That's kind of off the camera here. So those are some examples of different types of landslides or different type of mass wasting events you can have. I'm going to give you a couple more case histories now. Uh, one of those is in Disney, close to Disneyland in Anaheim. That's in Anaheim, California, right? And so Anaheim is is pretty much in what they call the Anaheim Hills. And so in this image, you can actually see a slump in the Anaheim Hills where it's taken part of a guy's backyard. And in fact, it's taken off part of a, a swimming pool over here on the right-hand side. And so... Here's a, and this is a helicopter photo. I don't know exactly who took this, but it's an amazing image that shows you that all that water is going out of that swimming pool. And here's a guy that's like, what am I going to do? Well, they would probably, you know, be forced to, okay, so, so who's going to pay for that, right? Who's going to pay for these things? Here's the area that's affected by this. And so this was part of a lawsuit at one time. And so the Anaheim Hills, you could see, would detach and then flow downhill. And many of the hills in California, in fact, are made out of mud. <laughs> and so you get debris flows, you get slumps, you get slump scarps and things like that. And it winds up, it not only takes out the infrastructure like the roads and the and the houses in a very expensive sort of neighborhood, a place that had a view. You could actually, I don't know if you could see the ocean from there, but it certainly, you'd have a beautiful view of, of Los Angeles there. And so these are areas that are prone to landslides. And so these landslides, this is a, a public sign. <laughs> this is you may f experience uneven, broken, uh, depressed, raised, or sealed streets, sidewalks, or curbs. And so exposed cables could be around there. There may be electrical service. There also could be plumbing and things like that. Exposed piping. Uneven driving surfaces. Remember the car that had flipped over in Hebgen Lake? Uh, that's the sort of thing that could happen here just as easily. And, you know, they don't have to happen with, they don't have to be triggered by earthquakes. They can actually occur just naturally, just by being saturated with water, perhaps. And then that activity of, you know, finally reaching the, the limit of what it's able to withstand and then detaching. So you have to watch where you go in certain areas out here. In that landslide, they, they say that there were over 500 residents in Anaheim who were affected by this. And so it could have happened naturally, but in some places, the roads were put in after the neighborhoods had already been established. And so the neighbor, when you put in a road that over steepens a slope, it becomes kind of an issue then. And so when the roads went in, the they began to detach some of the, the land around there. So in fact, you should not build in places that have over steepened slopes and, and places like that. And if you did have that sort of activity where there are houses. I, I've seen, I've taken photographs and in, in when I lived in the Bay Area, it was, uh, you know, I would take photographs of houses that were precariously perched and you could just tell it's like, that's not going to withstand the next earthquake probably. So there are ones out there, you know, you, 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 you roll the dice every time, every, you know, every place that you live in California. Um, so the question is, should the city of Anaheim, you know, compensate the, there's some crazy stuff that goes on, right? Now, you think about those houses. Those houses pay a lot of taxes. Now, they would if they could be lived in, right? So the city wants to see the tax money from the people who live in that area. And so they want to permit as many houses as they can that are of a high quality like that because they pay a lot of money. But if you permit it, and you collect those taxes, then should you also should you compensate the people who lost their houses in these sorts of events? And so, normally these sort of things are called what quote unquote acts of God. And so, um, you know, oftentimes even insurance companies will not cover some of the damages from landslides. And so, it's an issue that there wouldn't be lawsuits if it were an easy problem to solve. Okay. So there are lawsuits that are still going on about some of the issues here in Anaheim. So, but enough about Anaheim, uh, just know this is a, um, 
This is the opinion of one of the landowners here in an effort to keep the landslide victims from testifying in a trial at a trial by a jury of fellow homeowners in the city of Anaheim after six years of harassing legal attacks, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not here to like, you know, you can read this on your own, but at the same time, there's a lot of landowners that are not very happy about what happened with these landslides in Anaheim. And so, so that brings us to a point, it brings us to a point where if you are in an area that is susceptible for landslides, how do you how do you keep those things from actually destroying your property? There are a few ways. If you ever go to California, one of the things that's a common theme out there is people along cliffs or bluff faces, especially along the ocean, right? You'll see blue tarps stretched across there. They're trying to keep the water out of that cliff face so that cliff face doesn't become saturated and then collapse. And so blue tarps are everywhere in California in steep places like this. The other thing they try to do is they try to put in weep holes or they drill in laterally, horizontally into a hillside that may be made out of mud, essentially. So many of the, much of the coast range is made out of muds that were once in the ocean that have been uplifted and pushed onto land by subduction originally. And today there are earthquakes in this area. And so what they try to do is they drill into the hillside and allow the water to collect in perforated pipes, and then they try to drain the water out of those slopes. And so that's another way to try to mitigate the effects of, of you know, what potentially could become a mass wasting event. And so uh, there's no easy ways to, to fix it. And as a geologist, we know this, that there's no long-term solution for anything. In the grand scheme of things, nature is going to win. And so in the grand scheme of things, a slump will eventually go if you live in an area that's particularly susceptible for slumps. And so let me show you some images here. What the city in Anaheim, they, they agreed to pay $3 million, but of course that wasn't accepted by most of the people here. They lost their house, you know, and it's understandable. In this image, you can see where they're coming in to reconstruct one of the roadways here. You can see the, the tarps in this case, not the blue tarps, but white, you know, stretched white plastic stretched across the landscape here to keep water out of that scarp surface there. Because if you can keep the scarp dry, maybe that slip plane will be dry and not lubricated by the water that's in there. Um, so here they are rebuilding some of the, the, of the uh, the conduits, the culverts, and so forth in this landscape, and trying to channel the water away. Now, typically in California, it's a semi-arid sort of place, but El Nino brings in, you know, weather in, on a regular basis, and so then you have these sort of events, usually during El Nino sort of uh, times. In Japan, very clever. They've come along and they, they know the areas that are susceptible to landslides in Japan. And so they'll come in and try to engineer their way out of any issues that may occur. In this case here, they've got like giant washers and bolts that attach to the rock in the subsurface. And these sort of like concrete pads, if you will, will stitch that landslide, the unstable material back to the bedrock if they can. But as you know already, Japan is particularly susceptible for earthquakes, tsunamis, all these sort of events, even volcanoes, right? And so here, that's a temporary solution even then. Now, they may think that it's permanent, but in fact, and it may last for 100 years, or it could last for 150 years, or maybe even 300 years, but in in nature, nature is going to win eventually, you know, and so this will have to be mitigated and, you know, reviewed. How are they inspected and so forth, right, to make sure that they don't lose this sort of area. So um, you already know that rapid movements can lead to a loss of life. You also know that slow movements can damage property like in Anaheim, right? That wasn't a massive one shot event. It happened very, very slowly, but you lost part of the land there. So these areas can either be prone to rapid failure or they could be prone to slow failure, but the dynamics. So, so in other words, it's pretty important how we look at these things. And slow so landslides occur in all 50 of the United States. And then also 
there is a propensity for these things to cost a lot of money to, to fix. And so every year on average, there are about 25 people killed by landslide events. Even the eruption of Mount St. Helens was generated by a landslide, right? So remember that mountain gave way and that was due to the activity of an earthquake, right? So the earthquake let it slip and then it triggered that massive eruption. So earthquakes can trigger these things. You can have avalanches like the one in the, in the Caucasus Mountains that can trigger these things as well. And in this case, on the left-hand side, I just give you a little illustration here to show you, but there is a house at the top of the hill up here and a house at the bottom. And the one at the bottom was taken out by a debris flow here. The debris flow came, knocked the house off of its foundation. Of course, they put a boom around it to try to keep all of the debris from floating away and causing a lot of pollution as well. But, you know, that's in Puget Sound, actually. And so this is another area that's especially susceptible for for landslides. Any mountainous area, in fact, is going to be susceptible for landslides. One of the major issues in California, especially in Southern California, is that they have brush fires. And so those brush fires will take and burn all the vegetation and many of the like creosote, uh, chaparral, these sorts of like, you know, plants are really rich with volatile chemicals. And so when they catch on fire, they burn like crazy. It's like burning cedar locally here. If you've ever seen a cedar fire, they burn very, very hot. They burn very, very rapidly. And so, but anyway, these, these fires, these wildfires can also trigger later catastrophes. And so what you get, in fact, with this wildfire, it's burning off the vegetation. If you're going to kill those trees, these trees help to pin that earth material and even some rocks to the bedrock that's down below it. And so it's really important that you try to mitigate the effects of fires when you live in these places. And people have to live somewhere, right? And so people live in these areas that are susceptible for fires as well, but they could also be then susceptible for landslides. And so, so you can have triggering mechanisms with these things. And so what happens very commonly is you oversteepen a slope. So in this case, if you have a landslide, then you've already got a steep slope exposed. Then you don't want to build on that slope if you can get away from it. And so um, one of the terms that we use in geology to describe this sort of like setting about what is that slope is we use a term called critical angle of repose. Now, repose is a term that we use for resting, if you will. So what is the resting angle, for instance, on a pile of sand? Well, you've got experience with this, I'm sure, right? So you've seen a pile of sand before. You know that it has a certain angle on it. If you have clean, dry sand that all has the same grain size, it's going to have an angle on the sides of that pile of sand that's roughly 34 degrees. That is the critical angle for that material. And so the critical angle of repose, 34 degrees for clean, dry sand that has been, well, you have to pile it up, right? So wet sand, on the other hand, can stick together, right? Because of the, what we call surface tension of water. Water has a funny sort of shape to that molecule. Water actually looks like a little bit like Mickey Mouse to bring it back to, to Disney World. And water has a tendency to form chains, actually. And so water has a plus side and a minus side because of that polarity on the water molecule. When it sticks to a grain, the plus side or the minus side may stick, but in fact, it'll hold the grains together. So wet sand, you can build a sand castle with, right? And if it dries, then it becomes unstable. Well, if you're at the ocean, you may have salt that binds it together a little bit then, but eventually that sand is going to dry out and then it's going to be susceptible for some sort of mass wasting event. Even in, <laughs> that's, that's the fun part of geology. We get to do things like build sand castles and try to understand scientifically why it's doing this. So uh, wet sand, the grains will stick together. But if you get it too wet, then it's going to turn it into liquefaction, right? So then you get a thixotropic substance. If you shake it any, it's like you get that wet sand that may stick together. If you shake it, it's going to become liquefied and then liquefaction takes over and you get a, in this case, a sand flow, right? Or debris flow, I guess you could call it maybe if you have a large enough area of it. So critical angle of repose 
just for that one material. Now it's just one material. So if you have a pile of rocks, it's going to have something similar to that, right? Um, so these critical angles of, of repose are what people sometimes study, especially in engineering, right? You want to be able to understand what is the capacity for this material to hold a vertical and to hold a slope of any sort. There are materials out there that are unusual. I, I will point one out. One of them has silt-sized grains in it. It's a material called LUS, and LUS is actually a glacial dirt or dust particles, if you will. And if you've ever been around Kansas City and Worlds of Fun to take it to another amusement park sort of area, in, in Worlds of Fun in that area, there are the LUS bluffs that are in northwest Missouri. And so China has these things, western Kansas has these things, and western Missouri has these things as well. And so LUS has a tendency to be very stable when you keep, you can cut a vertical slope in it, and it'll stay that way. It just the grains lock together essentially, but if you put any sort of slope on that, if you grade it into more of a slope, the water will come along and cause it to then blow out essentially. It becomes more slippery and it becomes lubricated by the water. So uh, you have to overcome something called the coefficient of friction in order for things to really bust loose. And so in other words, if you've ever put your hand on a table and pushed against that table, and then eventually you can overcome that surface and you begin to slip, that's what the coefficient of friction is. And there's always a coefficient of friction associated with different materials. In most cases, when we talk about mass wasting, we're really talking about overcoming the coefficient of friction for bedrock. You know, so if you're going to bust a rock loose, how do you, how do, you do that? Well, you have to, to have the, the mass derive, you know, have a component of force uh, associated with that that's going to overcome that coefficient of friction here. Well, I'm going to show you some more examples now. Those are the kind of the key concepts. So we're talking about overcoming the coefficient of friction. We know that you can pile loose materials up and have a critical angle of repose as well. But very commonly in mass wasting events, we're talking about bedrock. And so with bedrock, you can even have rock that will become detached under the force of gravity. And so that happened in Yosemite National Park in 1996. And this is an image from the, the U.S. Geological Survey where there was a slab of rock in Yosemite National Park that cut loose and it fell to the ground. It generated this massive noise to begin with. And then it also had this high wind. There were like 200 mile an hour winds and it killed 2,000 trees around that rockfall. So the rockfall hit, blasted all the trees down. And, and sadly, it took out, uh, it took a person's life here. There was a person who was working one summer in Yosemite National Park, thought they would be going back to school in the fall and they never made it there because they were working in a concession stand. And that concession stand was flattened by this rock fall in this case. So that is a rock a slab of rock that fell and blasted open. And you can see all the debris associated with the thing here on the right hand side. So rock falls usually don't travel very far, uh, but they happen in Yosemite here. They can happen a lot of different places. So rock falls, any place where you have rock exposed and they had 200 mile an hour winds associated with this. There's some other interesting concepts that go along with this sort of thing. Now, we've already talked a little bit about rock avalanche, and you've seen an image where rock has flowed out across that glacier, Sherman Glacier in Alaska, and that was triggered by that earthquake in 1964. Rock avalanches, if you think about it, how do you keep a pile of boulders? Because rock avalanches actually can travel a long way. So if anything flows, it's going to have the capacity to go farther. So if rock falls pretty much stop where that rock ends and maybe two or three times the size of the rock that fell. There's a limit to how far you can get away, you know, with a rock fall, but with rock slides or with, with rock avalanches, you have a tendency to go farther. And so things that flow tend to go. And so uh, debris flows tend to go a long way. You've seen that with the Colca glacier collapse in the Caucasus Mountains, the rock avalanche also in the Sherman Glacier area in Alaska. So how do you get rock to flow? That's the question. If you think about it, in a rock avalanche, there are giant boulders that are coming really close together. And when they, they hit, 
it's going to rattle. And so there's actually something they call acoustic fluidization that can occur. So acoustically, you could shake things. It's a lot like, you know, we talked about sound waves, right? And so acoustic fluidization really is sound waves that keep that thing active. But you also have something called dispersive pressure. Maybe you have some experience with a, um, it's a game that came about in the 1980s, I think it was. In the early 80s, there was something we, uh, it was called air hockey, right? So you're probably familiar with an air hockey table. And there's a puck that floats on, a, on air, and that's called dispersive pressure, in fact. So you actually disperse and have air pressure keep something elevated. And you get the same thing with, with rock avalanches. When particles come really close together, you get a cushion of air that gets compressed around them. So if you can imagine, in every direction, things are coming together, that that becomes a very high-pressure sort of thing. I mean, it kind of just slides out then. And so that's kind of like an air air hockey puck, if you will, sliding out across the surface. And so rock avalanches can go a long ways. With dispersive pressure, you can get the same thing with fluids as well. So the fluids become compressed, and then you can have that flow continue on for a long ways. So if it flows, it goes. So rock avalanches, debris flows, and mud flows. All three of those have a capacity to go long, long distances. And they aren't always confined to valleys like they were in the Kolka glacier, uh, glacier collapse. And, and oftentimes they can actually, you know, go over other surfaces and branch out a little bit, if you will. So it's kind of a, a dangerous situation anytime you're around a mass wasting event. Now, this last one is one last case study here, and very briefly, I just want to tell you about it. In 1995, there was a, a slump. You can see the slump here. It is a cohesive mass that slid down a hill here, but at the very bottom of it, it generated a debris flow or a mud flow, you can say, but it came into the city of La Conchita in Southern California here. This is a coastal community where a lot of people live. It's a little bit less expensive than Santa Barbara, who are their rich neighbors here. Here you can see that some of the house damage that was done from that flow in 1995. So there have been multiple flows in this area. I think it was in the 1995 flow. There was a, uh, a musician in this area. His name was Jimmy Wallet, and his family was taken from them by this event. And so uh, these things cause a lot of devastation property-wise. They take a lot of lives as well, on average 25 a year in the United States. And so something to pay attention to. As a young person, you have your entire life ahead of you. You don't know how long it's going to be, but you're going to live somewhere. And so oftentimes people live in the places where their jobs are. So you may have to go to California. If you work in tech, you may go to Silicon Valley, or you may go to Puget Sound and live in Seattle or Portland, any one of these places, or you may go to L.A., or you may go to Colorado. And so those are the places that people live and work in this country. And in fact, even in the Appalachians, you're talking about Virginia, you're talking about Maryland, you're talking about West Virginia, and even places in Ohio. And in fact, the highest per capita expense-wise for, for mitigating the effects of mass wasting events, that's in Cincinnati, Ohio, of all places. It's, it's not California. In, in Cincinnati, Ohio, it's a function of the type of bedrock geology they have around it. They have a lot of shale, and shale allows things to slide. Well, you know, mud's slippery, right? And so the limestone, dolomite, those sort of rocks will actually slide over the top of the shale, and you wind up with a lot of landslides in places like Cincinnati, of all places. And so Cincinnati, Ohio, the highest per capita damages damage-wise for mass-wasting events. So I'm going to leave you with this one last slide. This was prepared by the U.S. Geological Survey. And so the areas that are particularly susceptible for landslide are shown in red here. Okay, so the red areas, and that includes all of the Blue Ridge, all of the Appalachians for the most part, and even on up into uh, New Hampshire, Vermont in that area, and on into Maine. So that's the Appalachians. And then also, even in, in like places along the bluffs, along the Mississippi River, are particularly susceptible for landslide as well. And they show you some of the areas of Lusk Bluffs on here. Those are in the green in western Missouri here. And then also all of the mountainous west is pretty much 
you know, landslide area and pretty much all of California, especially Northern California because of the higher amount of rain that they get in Northern California as opposed to Southern California. So this is a process we call mass wasting. If you open a newspaper and you see a headline that says massive landslide and blah, 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 whatever that location is, know that that's a mass wasting event that has occurred. So I, I want to leave it there, but I can't leave it there quite. Um, what I want to encourage you to do is look up landslide. Now, do this on YouTube. Look up landslide. There are some landslides out there. I can't show you, okay, on this YouTube video, but you can see these things in real time because everybody has a cell phone now and everybody takes images of these things, right? So you take videos of landslide events and that's the most common thing. So people, you, you, you go in and do a search on landslides if you're in you know, YouTube. And so in YouTube, and there's one in, in um, I think they call them quick muds or I don't know exactly what the term was that they use for these ones in Norway. You can see the houses just sliding and riding out this massive mass wasting event. And if you look also, there are some um, either somewhere in Asia, I'm not exactly sure which country it is. It may be in the Philippines or it may be in China or it may be in one of the other Southeast Asian uh, countries, but you can actually see the land moving in some of the video there and taking out houses. And, and so be cognizant of that, I guess, is what I would say. When you when you buy a house or when you rent a house or you rent an apartment, think about the hazards that are around you. That's one of the reasons why we teach this course, in fact, is so that you become more fully aware of what's around you. Um, and I will leave it there. Okay, so go to go to YouTube, look up landscape.